Aloha, everyone. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii today. It's um, Thursday, December 9th, and this program is Politics for the People. And uh, we're a weekly show and uh, welcome you aboard. Today, uh, I'm your show host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, uh, but this show will be a discussion of an article uh, by Barton Gelman. Um, uh, and, and Jay Fidel is here with me to discuss the article and, uh, and, and share what are some compelling uh, inf information points we want to get out to raise public awareness about the current situation, which we think he has described aptly, as you will see in the discussion. So um, the name of the article, which was published in the Atlantic uh, last week, and has been shown on major news programs. The name of the article is um, How Trump and the Republicans Imperil um, the, the U.S. Election. And his, his, his specific topic is the coup has already begun to overturn democracy in America. So this, um, th this is a topic that we feel it needs to be widespread and um, broadcast. And Gelman's major first point is that January 6th, the insurrection was a practice run for his effort to overturn democracy and continue his own dictatorship. And the, and the other activity subsequent to that, all the machinations that he and the Republicans have made since actually the election, but very strongly since January the 1st, um, has put them in a ready-go position for having a successful coup in the next election, uh, which I'm referring to 2024, but with some repercussions for 2022 also. Jay, what do you make of that proposition that Gelman presents early in the article? Well, I believed it for some time. It's not a surprise, although I'd say that he he expressed it very well. He articulated and supported it and made a rational discussion of it, for sure. And the whole article, which is a quite a lengthy article, in fact, the audio of it is an hour and 38 minutes long, um, is, is a defense of that particular position. And, um, you know, in case we haven't been watching, he connects all the dots. I mean, we got to get him on the show, Stephanie. I don't know why you don't Let's call give it a him. Well, everybody else has on <laughs> the cable news. Maybe he's ready to roll. And well, that article was really worth it. You know, sometimes an article appears and it, is, it takes on a tremendous value, a tremendous interest. And that's why um, a lot of the talk show hosts have, have brought him on, um, because it is an extraordinary article. Uh, it's a it's a detailed examination of where we are, and it is not distracted by anything. It is yeah. it is covering the you know the essential points of where this country is going. Yeah. That's why it's so valuable, and I would urge everybody to read it. It was on the Atlantic last week, and P.S. on the Atlantic, Stephanie. You know, the Atlantic used to be a literary magazine. That's true. The Monthly, right? Yes, yeah. I would. And, and things changed, and it's one of those remarkable changes. That we've seen in recent years during the Trump administration, I suppose, where all of a sudden the editors changed, and maybe the publishers changed too. I don't know, uh, and and the and the and the material, the content, has changed. And now you have, uh, you know, uh, Goldberg, who is the, uh, you know, chief editor, editor in chief. You have um, uh, Ann uh, Applebaum, who is a remarkable writer, who has written some extraordinary articles in in the past couple three years, and. And uh, now uh, Barton Kelman, I shouldn't say now because he's written extraordinary articles mm -hmm. before, but this one is the one that catches your attention because this one is completely timely. This one catches the moment, you know, uh, uh, the tipping point, if you will, um, something that we all ought to be watching. Uh, so, uh, so I think, um, you know, I, if, to answer your question, I totally agree with what he's saying. Yeah. I think he speaks truth and he speaks wisdom. That that is a, an apt description of the activity of one uh, six January six. Well, I wanted to uh, know um, if you can talk a little bit about how did Trump and the Republicans move into this very good position, uh, which is frightening enough to generate 
all this discussion and attention to Gilman's article and, and others too. But how did he do this without using any presidential powers whatsoever over the, the sweep of time from the election? Can you talk a little bit about what, what has happened and how he managed this? Well, I'd like to step one step back and say, why? You know, and his um, niece, is it Mary Trump? Yeah, yeah. He's instructive on that point. I mean, uh, Donald Trump is a very strange and pathological character. Um, more than that, he's been in positions of power from the time he, his father anointed him. Um, and his father trained him also in racism uh, from, you know, a long time ago. And somewhere in that, that psychological makeup is a destroyer. Uh, Trump would destroy things. And somewhere in his um, awakening, if you will, his political awakening, which was long before he ran for president, uh, he decided that he wanted to destroy as much as possible. And if you look back uh, in the, uh, the years of his presidency, and certainly um, at the later years of his presidency, you see that he is you know, affirmatively committed to destroying the country. I don't mean anything less than that. That's what I mean. Destroying the country, destroying the democracy, destroying the social fabric, destroying whatever, you know, collective, um, you know, togetherness we have. And he's done a really terrific job at that. I would differ with you, though, Stephanie, on the question, of, and, and to the extent that Barton Gelman may suggest this, that he did this without, you know, using presidential power. Um, I think he has used presidential power in many ways. Um, I think he's used the bully platform. Even if he never used a statutory power or a regulatory power, um, he's used the bully platform. And, and he's also used his authority with, um, you know, with the government as the commander in chief, as the chief executive. Um, well, well, do, you, do you think it was intentional, though, that he didn't make any moves like in uh, wag the dog or whatever those threats were that people thought um, other other leaders might make to keep themselves in power. That he didn't make any moves that were like official or uh, a, a potential or probable misuse of presidential power. Do you think that he's canny enough to have worked his way around that issue, which leaves him pretty much in the clear? Right, because what well, I think he's, he's pragmatic and he stopped short sometimes because of the advice of his advisors, which he he rarely has taken, but he apparently took it a, a couple of times and stopped short of doing, you know, getting into a war over it. But he did a lot of things that were close to that. I mean, think about it alienate all of Europe, alienate the United Nations, um, uh, yeah. you know, have these very strange diplomatic relations with North Korea, China, Russia. These are really strange things, very destructive things. And although they're not at the level of wag the dog, they're right on that continuum. And he did that, you know, in, in his office as a part of his, um, you know, official position. And um, so I think he used his position to achieve those things, but they are things that benefit him, that benefit his corruption, um, and that do not benefit the country. I mean, somewhere early on in his presidency, uh, he decided he didn't care about the country. He was only going to benefit himself. Now, if that meant he had to benefit some of his, um, you know, his contributors, his donors, the, the guys who gave him big bucks, uh, fine. But, but that was for his benefit, not for the country's benefit. I would say he hasn't done anything to benefit the country at all because mm -hmm. he's been engaged in destroying the country. And when okay. you think about the destruction he's done, yeah. you know, my proposition is, is totally right. Well, I think that you're on point here. And uh, because when we stop to think about um, the foundation of this, all, all of his dis destruction, um, there is a belief system that he's been putting in place. And I believe Gelman, did, did, um, uh, think about this, to respond to Barton Gelman's um, suggestion that there's a um, a belief system that he hasn't he hasn't um, inculcated in the in the nation's people who follow him, so that he 
Gelman said that he's convinced them that corruption is working in our de democracy. And that's what's driving a lot of this, that fraud made up or whatever is definitely true. That only cheating can, can give them or up, get in the way of or thwart their victory at the polls. So that's okay to do. And, um, and tyranny has disrupted by these terrible Democrats, the US government. And finally, the huge point is that violence is a legitimate response to getting their way, to the Republicans and Trump getting their way. Now that's what Gelman summarized as some foundational principles or beliefs that he's established among his followers. Do you think that uh, he's covering the tracks there? Oh, sure. Well, think about it. You know, he spent four years building a base, an irrational base. Um, and as it went forward and he found that he could do that, that people would irrationally follow him, even to their own detriment, it's quite remarkable, then he would go further. That's what a pathology like his uh, leads to. You try it, if it works, then you try it again and worse. And so if you, if you connected the dots, um, you know, uh, philosophically, um, conceptually, over the course of his four years, you see that. He tries this, it works. He gets more, you know, aggressive about it and tries that. And so each, you could chart this out. Each one of these steps leads to another more outrageous step. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, he wasn't nearly as outrageous at the beginning as he was by the end when he realized that people would support him in whatever he did, you know, he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue. And I think it's clear right now that he could himself. He could shoot somebody in Fifth Avenue and, and get well, away with it. Why was he that attractive at the start? I mean, I understand now what's happening, you know, with these points Gelman's making. But, but what about at the beginning? What, that came pretty early on. Well, even towards end of campaign, why was he so compelling? What do you think that was that set up? this opportunity for him. Well, he, he, he you know, people think he's uh, ignorant, stupid, but not. You know, he's got a kind of intuitive, yeah. mm -hmm. intuitive brilliance on mm -hmm. how to work people who are ignorant and stupid. And so, uh, you know, what he, what he did was he found divisions in the country and widened them. And mm -hmm. Facebook and Putin helped him do that. Okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, intentionally, willfully, scientifically helped him do that. So now we have these divisions and he capitalizes on the divisions. Furthermore, you know, this is a time when the, the rural areas, uh, you know, falling into a kind of populism. They don't know, they don't care. They, they re uh, resent um, the liberals on the coasts in the big cities um, for taking liberal positions, for caring about the social safety net, for caring about, um, you know, collaboration with other countries and all that. And, and he's found a group that doesn't believe in that, the populists, the nationalists. And he plays on that. He plays on the division. And it's, it's worked for him politically. He sees it as a political opportunity, and he's played on it increasingly over the past what, five years now. So um, he's not so stupid after all. He's created a, 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 a base that's way bigger, you know, think about this, than it was at the beginning. And he's hollowed out the government. You know, he's, he hasn't appointed, he didn't appoint a lot of people. So, you know, the, the, the government culture at the end of his term was just the president making all the decisions. I mean, I, I know people who walked the halls of the State Department, nobody was there. They walked the halls of other, you know, government agencies, important agencies, nobody was there because he didn't appoint anybody. Um, they all belonged to him. And he created this culture of loyalty. You know, if you're loyal to me, I'll reward you. I'll give you corruption. Um, if you're not loyal to me, I'll, I'll make your life miserable, fire you, um, force you out of the government. So he's done that systematically. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all so reminiscent of The Apprentice, where he attacked people. If you remember on that show, he yeah, attacked people for no good reason at all, um, you know, and, and, and destroyed them, uh, you know, at least in the context of the... Uh, so of this the is some the really diabolical match between what are his natural pro, pro, pink, pro, propensities to thinking and, and, and acting to what he had at, in the White House and that he could do there. He saw- Well, well you know, he used people around him. He, you know, he used some of the people in the Republican Party. 
Um, they use the whole QAnon thing, the conspiracy people. Um, he, he himself is, you know, is a conspiracist. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what happened is that the Republican Party, while we weren't watching, went away. It got hollowed out like the government got hollowed out. And the people left there are not really classical Republicans at all. Um, you know, Bob Dole is a Republican. Uh, how many Republicans do we have there now in the Republican Party? Very, very few, if any. Um, so, you know, he changed it. He, he converted it. He turned, he turned it inside out. And people should not come away from all of that with the, with the notion that, oh, yeah, this is the Republican Party. It's not the Republican Party. It's the Trump Party. Uh -huh. And he's made it into his party. Um, this is very scary because it, it's reminiscent of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. He's using a lot of the tricks uh, that the, you know, the Hitler used in those days and Mussolini in order to make the whole government belong to him. And it still does. That is one of the most remarkable things. He's out of office. He's off the media. Um, but they still quote him and they still give him a voice. Uh, well, I, it's I, just, I want, just I want to be, I just want to make the point that he has managed to own the Republican Party. Yeah. And he has managed to pervert the Republican Party. But so, we but, should talk about the, the high news item today, Stephanie, and see where it, it fits in all of that. Okay, remember we were having a crisis over the past two or three months over funding the government, right? Of course. And it got resolved today because a number of Republicans uh, left the ship, so to speak, yeah. and McConnell left the ship. Uh, yeah. They yeah. agreed with the, um, you know, I guess the, the, um, the Democrats in the Senate Schumer uh, to make a deal to fund the government. Yes. This is this is it's it, itself it's an absurdity because what what is the big issue about funding the government? Um, it's, it's incredible that we should have a fight that goes on for months. Well, and especially these guys it's swearing the cost, it's a cost of the last election. So this is paying for the Republicans' expenditures. Okay, for the most part, that's what it's about. But I wanted to ask you, uh, why are with all of this news and all of these successes that they're having um, that are detrimental to our culture or to our, our democracy, why are the Democrats and others, independents, et cetera, why are they not taking notice or publicly, um, uh, openly talking about what's going on and what they're going to do about it? What do you think is going on there? Why aren't they silent? No, they're populists, they're nationalists. He's a, he's a kind of a hero, an anti-hero. And uh, they still, even after all the trouble, um, they still follow him. It is extraordinary. But, but what it, about it is also emblematic of the end of our democracy. Well, yes, but what about the, the Democratic Party and all the others that are, are not uh, Trumpers? So well, that's why, the point that they, Barton Kelman And that's raises. one of Kelman. Well, Gelman is making that point. So why is it that they're not, and how is it that they can remain inactive and unspoken because they know where that goes. I don't know what the how is, but the, the reality, which Gelman goes into in some detail in his article, is that there's nobody uh, in the Democratic Party that is actually countervailing what Trump and his friends are doing. Exactly. And when you take that together with the things that Trump and his friends are doing, what you get is a <clears throat> failed democracy, a failed state, if you will. Um, and certainly um, the, the complete um, forfeiture of the 2022 and 2024 elections. Uh, and, and that's because um, nobody is really fighting back. That's this point. So, you know, all you have to do is track all the things they are doing to undermine, you know, the institution of voting in this country. So that's on one side of the ledger. On the other side is what have the Democrats done to countervail to argue, to bring people over to their side of that, of that, you know, uh, you know that issue, and um, they haven't done much, and they're not likely to do much, and there is no strong leader, including Biden, uh, who is doing it or capable of doing it. So he draws a line from where we are now to the election dates, and he says, you know, they, they, the Republicans are going to win this. They have suppressed the vote. They have depressed people's view of government and the courts and the Congress. Um, people are abandoning a whole notion of democracy. So in a way, he's already achieved it. 
Well, you have mentioned one of the actions uh, to prevent um, this coup from occurring that came from um, Jocelyn Benson, who's the Michigan Secretary of State, and what her first uh, recommendation or re requirement that has to be put in place, of course, is that the voters have to take on responsibility, do their duty, and put strong officials like secretaries of state in position, and they need to have um, authority and strength to do their job. So you mentioned that too. So that's in following up on your point. And what, what else can be done to, to give us some prevention or some intervention for the carrying through of this coup? What is going to stop the train or get in its way from the Democratic side? I, I hate to say this, but that's uh, um, uh, the, uh, the article stands for the proposition that there, there is nothing that it's too late. It's already happened. Um, the pension, um, you know, is a point of light. And yeah. so is a point of light that they were able to draw a few uh, Republicans over to continue funding the government. Uh, that's a point of light. I suppose uh, if Winston were here, he would say, let's be optimistic about it. I'm, I'm not optimistic about it because I only see it as a point of light. The, the, you know, that's, that's what um, Burton... Uh, mm -hmm. Burton. Um, well, yeah, yeah, that's that's, what Bert, what's his last name? Burton. Gelman. Burton Gelman's uh, Burton Gelman, article yeah. is about, um, namely, yeah, don't get confused. Yes, we have point of, if you want, if you have wishful thinking that you want to see something that's worthy of some optimism, you know, go for it. But that's not the prevailing history around us. The yeah. prevailing history around us is that in a dozen states or more, more every day, there is suppression of voting, uh, which the Supreme Court isn't gonna do anything about, um, and Congress isn't gonna do anything about. Um, there is um, you know, this whole thing with gerrymandering, which the Supreme Court isn't gonna do anything about, and Congress isn't gonna do anything about. Um, voting rights, forget about it. Um, the, the Republicans not only are having their way, they've already had their way. And, and then, of course, when you get into the elections themselves, and um, this is really sad, you find out that there are officials who have replaced the old officials who are perfectly willing to take Trump's instructions on finding votes, exactly. ignoring legitimate votes, and turning the whole election around yeah. like he wanted to do last year, turning it all around yeah. and having a few people official. determine what the public vote was. Yes. And, and so that's that going to happen again. And then, of course, you have challenges in the courts, yeah. but it's it's it. it's come clear, Stephanie, that the courts are no longer reliable. Um, at the district court level, federal courts, at the court of appeals level, and certainly at the Supreme Court level, it's clear they're going to back him up. Uh, they're not going to they're not going to support voting. They're not going to knock off the suppression. Uh, they're not going to knock off these steps the Republicans have taken to switch out secretaries of state. Um, at the end of the day, the, the courts cannot be relied upon. So what is going to happen too slow. at best? What's going to happen at best is we're going to have litigation that goes beyond election day all it's, over the country, which the has point. already started. And at worst, the courts turn against these democratic notions yeah. and don't allow any relief, which is actually, you know, something that is already happening and yeah. on some well, issues. Let, let me bring up another point here that Gellman made. And it has to do with, of course, that the targets, the big targets of, of the Trumps and Republicans, the Trump and the Republicans, um, are the six states that are likely to have close elections or, or um, uh, sl very slim margins. Okay, so um, one of the things that that Trump has been able to do in this situation and looks like he's working to make it happen as much as he can because some the states are putting in these new laws and yes, they seem to be all on the side of the Republic, Republican um, agenda, but which in case, in, in the case that they are, they still have potential to um, disrupt and to cause chaos because they're new and, and people don't understand them. And then there will be this chaos in the state. So, what is it that Trump knows how to do with chaos that makes it this powerful lever 
he uses to move things in the direction he wants. Do you have any sense of how that works and, and how and why he does that? And how, what does it get him? I mean, obviously it gets him a lot, but maybe you could comment on that. It's one thing in the Gelman article that I found very interesting with regard to these six states and the likelihood of their having problems and then being chaotic. And then Trump takes that chaos and does something with it. He's, he's, he's an anarchist. What well, he's an excellent anarchist. So how does it work? Well, there's several parts to it. I mean, one I mentioned earlier is that um, you know he's uh, he's a destroyer, mm -hmm. and uh, he's attracting people uh, to the notion of populism and nationalism, and destroyism. You know, if you live in the rural part of the country, you really don't like the liberals on the coast. So he's 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 feeding on that, and he's encouraging that, and he's using that as a a divisive mechanism with social media. Regrettably, the social media goes along with him on that and them. <clears throat> Secondly, he's systematically uh, removed uh, the old time Republicans out of the Republican Party, and he's, he's managed to fill it up with uh, populists and nationals uh, who are loyal to Trump. It's quite, <clears throat> it's quite amazing. It is. Uh, so, so let me go further to answer sure, the question. Sure, go ahead. I mean, how he turns it against the system. You know, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. okay. Then, then you have uh, the courts. He stopped the courts, and the courts back up uh, these people. You know these these um, these Trumpers uh, in the legislatures, uh, and you know this is not accidental. It's not coincidental. He's he's had a plan and a team and a conspiratorial arrangement to do this for a long time, and it's coming home to roost now. You know what happened in the Willard Hotel? What happened? All those people who participated in the planning and the execution of the January 6th insurrection <clears throat> and the steps after the January 6th insurrection to prevent mm -hmm. any impeachment um, or uh, uh, in, you know, investigation of it is part of a larger plan. Right. So you have to realize that Trump, for all his bumbling and stupidity, all his you know, inane remarks and crazy destructive statements, he's got a team that plans this stuff. And they well, are JD, Trumpers and they are traitors to the country, but that's what they are doing, and that's why he is and, successful in doing this. And isn't this one of the, the contributions, significant contributions of the 1 6 committee, is that they've revealed this? Would we have known about the Willard Hotel and all of the rest of the, the advanced planning and coordination of, of, the, of the assault? Would we have known about that without the 1 6 committee? Is that not a contribution? In well, your we would have speculated. Now we know it's a matter of evidence, and that's good. I believe you're saying that we, we probably had assumed that. or I mean, I don't remember seeing anything written about it. Maybe Gelman could have done an article on that. And in fact, maybe that is mentioned, by the way, in his first article. Yeah, November. Uh, first he article. wrote an article in November. Yeah, which is how, which was about the destruction of uh, America, how, how the Republicans could destroy America. And he wrote that in November, and that turned out to be absolutely true. And including in that article, he, he posited that there would be a 1-6, uh, an assault on, on, the, on the government, which he didn't know what date, but he did say everything that happened. And he was, he was shown to be accurately predicting the whole se series of events. And I think that that's one of the reasons he's, he's uh, being paid so much attention to now. But I wanted to ask if the other suggestions that, that um, the Michigan um, S Secretary of State suggested get put in place, like, um, of course, uh, federal government support to to disallow the undermining of our of our our beliefs and values and government system, and also that there, in order to help with that, um, to go further is to to have federal and state task forces in place to actually go up against. Um, what it is that they're trying to do in dismantling our, our, our democracy. Do you see those as hopeful at all? No. Activities? Who's going to do that? And all the Republicans will oppose that. Uh, they oppose everything that Democrats want to do. It would be the Democrats who want to do that. Republicans would oppose it everywhere. Um, and certainly Congress is not going to do anything because Congress can't do anything. Yeah. And for, for most purposes, Congress is inactive, dysfunctional. 
non-functional. Congress almost you know, doesn't exist. I don't know why we spend all the money on the people in Congress when Congress no, doesn't do anything. Sure. They don't develop policy. They don't deal with what's happening in the country. Uh, they, they're not even respectful to the other side. Um, the bottom line is that Congress isn't going to do anything. Um, the Supreme Court isn't going to do anything. They're, they're lost in space, I'm sorry. Um, and finally, uh, will Biden do anything? Yeah. Um, he's, he's very modest and mild-mannered, and he's got a very modest and mild-mannered attorney general, and I'm not sure. And he's got a vice president who doesn't do anything. So um, you know, who's going to do something? Task forces? No, not going to happen. We are cruising, and I agree with Gelman on this, we are cruising directly into a disaster in 2022, where A, uh, the Republicans win back the House and the Senate, both. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and then if they don't, there'll be litigation about it. There'll be these, these familiar claims that the Democrats rigged the election. It'll never come to rest. Um, our, our democracy is already broken. And 2024, you can assume the same thing and worse. Well, you know, we're reaching uh, the end of our, our conversational time. So I want to close with uh, your mentioning briefly, if you think that McConnell, given some of his moves lately, is in any way um, getting in the way of Trump. And is that anything that, that could be considered positive? Oh, it is. It is positive. He voted. He voted for refunding the government. That is something, and he and he allowed, if you want to use that word, a number of Republicans in the Senate to do the same. Um, so yeah, there's. It seems like there's some hope there, but at the maybe end of the day, to the plate. Maybe he is stepping up to what he claims are his principles and values. My answer: No. I think he realized uh, from a you know a, a practical point of view that if if that failed, if funding the government failed, it would be a national and international disaster of major magnitude. So he mm -hmm. figured he'd better go along with it. Yeah, I know it's, we probably not actually on him. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe. Well, give us a final comment, Jay. Uh, uh, I know uh, so far you've been fairly pessimistic <laughs> and uh, seen us moving in the direction of the storm instead of away from it and not even getting ready for it. So tell us if there's any other comment you'd like to share on this program about that. I agree with Barton Gilman. I agree that uh, these, these forces are in place that are destroying our democracy in many ways they already have. And uh, I agree with Barton Gelman that I do not see any forces that countervail um, the negative forces that will save us. I don't see them on the horizon, either for 2022 or 2024. And therefore, I am very concerned about the future of the country and all of us, each one, every single one. May God bless us all. Yeah. We're all going to need it. I'm sure you speak for many, many viewers. And I... Um... Thank you for your participation today in this conversation on the, the Barton Gelman article that the coup has already begun uh, here uh, to dismantle our election process. And this is Think Tech Hawaii um, on a weekly discussion show, Politics for the People. And we look forward to seeing you next week, same time. I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Thank you, your, your host for this show. And um, we've been talking with uh, Jay Fidel about the article I've already mentioned. Aloha, mahalo.